Happy Sabbath, brethren. Hope your Sabbath is going well. Brethren, there are critical moments in history where certain actions can lead to events that can change the world forever. And after those events, everything was different after that. We think in recent history of you know, 9-11 and how there was pre-9-11 and there was a distinct post-9-11, how things changed. This year, we can think of COVID-19 and how there was life before COVID and there's life after. There was a clear distinction before and after. And one of these moments that I want to touch on is a moment where Julius Caesar famous, famously uttered the words, Aelia Iacta Est, or the die is cast, when he marched his army south to Rome as they crossed over the Rubicon River. And why was this important, this, this um, crossing? Back in the time of Caesar, the Rubicon was a, it was a minor river. Today, if you look and see pictures of it, it just looks like a stream. But this statement that he made as he crossed over the Rubicon with his army changed world history forever. Caesar, the most influential general in Roman history with this powerful 13th Legion was ordered by the Roman Senate to disband his army and return home. Um, the Rubicon was the northern border of, of Italy, and past it was Cisalpine Gaul, where Caesar was appointed governor. Of, um, go governor. So the act of crossing the Rubicon was a declaration of because no general could enter Italy with a standing army. The title of this message is, oh, sorry. Caesar is recorded to have said to his troops, we can still go home, but once we cross this river, there is no turning back. There, is, there will be nothing left to do but to see this through. And then he finally said the phrase, the die is cast, and then he marched towards Rome. The title of this message is, the die is cast. Now this phrase come, has come to mean you know, both a sense of inevitability and a sense of the unknown and uncertainty. You know, the moment the dice is in the air, there's no stopping it. And you don't know how it's going to land. Again, inevitably, ine inevitability and the unknown, element of success or failure. In the case of Caesar in the 13th Legion, it, for them, it was literally do or die. Our journey through this life as Christians can be, can be similar. We have Rubicons in our lives that we have to cross. As we make the commitment at baptism, there was a clear before and there was a clear after we go through that crossing. And we can't turn our back, we can't go halfway, and we may not know what will happen along the way, whether it's failures or success, but we have to see it through because victory is the only option. When we answer the call of Christ to follow him, it sets a chain of events of a towards a completely different life. But there's a cost to the discipleship. And the cost is our, own, our old former lives. Uh, turn with me to Luke 9, 57. Luke 9, uh, verse 57. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus responded, responded and said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. As Christians, we don't really have a place to lay our head. We don't really have a home in this world. We're not supposed to fit in and belong like everyone else. In fact, we're supposed to be strangers leading a life towards a different goal sojourners, people wandering in the wilderness, just like Christ had no place to lay his head, same with us. We are pilgrims in search of our home, and we're not supposed to look like foxes. We're not supposed to look like birds. We're not supposed to look like everyone else. We're supposed to look like Christ. Verse 59, then he said to another, follow me. Then he said, Lord, let me first go bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the, bury, let the dead bury their own dead, but you can go and preach the kingdom of God. 
this wasn't just someone's father who had just died. Uh, you know, otherwise there would be mourning. Um, back in that culture and back in during those times, when somebody died, they would have taken care. Of, they would have buried them that same day. Now this was somebody saying that. Let me f finish this first. Let me finish um, this before following you. But this, as we know, there's no perfect timing of when we'll get the call of God, the call to, to life. Sometimes you hear people say, you know, I'll follow God when I settle down, or I'll follow God after I graduate school, or I'll follow God after this and this. But God asks us to leave our former dead self behind and follow him. Even if the timing, the timing doesn't seem like it seems perfect, he says, go preach the kingdom of God. And also another said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, knowing having, having, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. But then there's no, there's no looking back here. When we make the choice to follow him, again, the die has been cast. There's no going back to the former life once we cross that threshold. There's only moving forward. We can't, we can't miss our former lives. We can't pine for how things used to be. It's what's in front of us right now, one foot in front, in front of the other foot. Just like Caesar when in the 13th Legion, they couldn't cross the Rubicon and say, oh, just kidding, we're going to go back. We didn't really mean it. No, crossing that boundary meant that they would have been, they would have been branded bandits and condemned to death. So it is either that or victory in taking Rome. They had to fully commit to what they were about to do. You know, we think in the Bible, we think of Lot's wife who don't look back. Well, Lot's, Lot's wife looked back and she was turned into a pillar of salt. She looked back at her former city, her former life, and imagined what she was going to be saying farewell to her family, her friends, her social circle, the life of comfort, of maybe of influence, probably some wealth and luxuries. And she was gonna miss those things. And she, looked, and she looked back. And we can't look back, brethren. We can't look back once we make that crossing. And that's what it takes, brethren. At baptism, all of us who are baptized, we all had to make that difficult choice, that, that choice, and sometimes, and keep making that choice, if this is what we really want to do or not. But that's just the beginning. In the beginning, we're excited, we're convicted. You know, some of us gave jobs, gave up jobs. Some of us um, gave up jobs because of the feast. Some of us probably annoyed some family members about not keeping Christmas or eating pork. You know, we had so much excitement and conviction and optimism. I remember when I got baptized in, um, it was December 13th, 2013. <laughs> Weirdly enough, it was Friday the 13th. The good thing we're not suspicious, superstitious. I remember how excited I was, how optimistic I felt embarking on a, a new life, a new journey. Um, it was in Cincinnati, Ohio, surrounded by my classmates at ABC. It was in a warehouse in a horse trough. Um, in fact, Kaylee Toms was there and she took the video uh, of my baptism because my dad couldn't make it. And so she took the video for him. Thank you, Kaylee. Um, but that was just the beginning and it was unforgettable, but it was just the beginning of the journey. It was just barely setting out on the journey. And we know life isn't always easy. There can be many struggles, trials, disappointments, and setbacks. Um, turn with me to Hebrews 10, 32. Hebrews 10, 32. But recall the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with suffering. Jumping down. For you had compassion on me in my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has a great reward. He's saying here, don't, don't lose sight on the path. Don't grow weary in doing good. Don't lose confidence in the path that you are on. Keep going. It says here, verse 36, for you have need of endurance so that you have done the will of God. So after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Brethren, we need endurance. 
it's one thing to set set on the path towards the kingdom of God, but it's another thing to have endurance, to keep going, to see it through. And some of us didn't expect the journey to take this long. I'm sure a lot of a lot of you in the old worldwide days thought that Christ was coming in the 70s. And there was a lot of excitement. And when he didn't come, there was, you know, that people may have fallen away or gotten discouraged. But Christ asked us, verse 37, for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and not tarry. tarry. Now the now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Brethren, we have to see it through. We can't be like Lot's wife, look back at what she was going to miss in her former life. God wants to keep our eyes fixed forward to the next bend of the road and to the end goal. When we talk about the Rubicon, something interesting that I recently learned was Rubicon, actually, if you break down the, the etymology of Rubicon, the river, um, it comes from the word, the, the root word, Rubeus. Rubeus. And, you know, any guesses on what Rubeus meant? It meant red, um, ruddy from the iron deposits in its riverbanks. It even sounds like the word ruby. The Israelites crossed their, so to speak, red, you know, body of water, the, the, the Yam Suf or the Red Sea, when they left Egypt in Exodus 14. This was their type of, of Rubicon. And we know the story of the dramatic and miraculous crossing of the Red Sea. We can imagine it in our minds. We can picture the drama as they were trapped from all directions, the Egyptians pinning them down. And the only way out was to go into the sea. And having that miracle of the Red Sea being opened up and the water stopped and them crossing through and the Egyptians being uh, drowned afterwards. And right after that, there was celebration. There were songs what God has done. But not too long after that, when they went to the wilderness, we get to Exodus 16.1. And in Exodus 16.1, um, the children of Israel, they journeyed from Elam, and the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th of the second month. 15th day of the second month after they had departed from Egypt. So it's on the 15th day of the second month, not very long after. And in verse two, it says, then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we had sat by the pots of meat and when we ate the bread to the full. For you have brought us out, out into the wilderness to kill us, this whole assembly with hunger. Well, that was their attitude right after they had just witnessed a few weeks before crossing the Red Sea. They miss their former lives. They miss the easy access to meat, even though they were slaves. They missed the benefits of having easy access to bread, to meat, and they for completely forgot about what happened in the Red Sea. Brethren, our human nature sometimes makes it easy for us to forget the miracles that God has performed for us to, that, that have led us towards baptism, that has led us towards conversion, that he has done for us along this journey. It's easy for us to miss the, our former lives, but that wasn't really life. When we cross that Rubicon, we have to keep moving forward. We have to leave Egypt behind. We can't take it with us. When I first started my job um, at Nike uh, two years and three months ago, yesterday, um, they moved me from Oklahoma to California. And one of the first things I did was purchase the book, um, Shoe Dog, Shoe Dog. And the, the Shoe Dog uh, is a memoir um, written by the founder of Nike, Phil Knight. Um, surprisingly, when I got to the office, nobody had read the book. I was the only one, kind of interesting. and. In the first four paragraphs of the book, he talks about his birthplace and home, uh, Portland, Oregon. And Phil Knight writes, I think it's the fourth paragraph, first page, if we Oregonians were famous for anything, 
it was an old, old trail we blaze. We had to blaze to get here. He said, the best teacher I ever had, one of the finest men I ever knew, spoke of that trail often. It's our birthright, he growled, our character, our fate, our DNA. The cowards never started, he'd tell me, and the weak died along the way. That leaves us. Us, some rare strain of pioneer spirit was discovered along that trail. My teacher believed that some outsized sense of possibility mixed with diminished capacity for pessimism. And it was our job as Oregonians to keep that strain alive. First of all, that, what a great beginning of a book. What a great introduction to a book. Um, very captivating. And it, this led me to do some research on the Oregon Trail. And I actually recently heard a sermon by Gary Petty that, that connects really well to this called The Magnificent Obsession. I recommend that sermon. Here are some key things I learned about the trail, uh, the Oregon Trail. These were folks that um, in the 1800s, 1800s, they set out to what they thought would have been the promised land, the promise of westward expansion, manifest destiny to, towards Oregon. You know, these were folks from Ohio, Vermont, New York, Pennsylvania, leaving what they had, looking for land. It left based on a promise of six months of travel for the rest of their lives, the promise of the rest of their lives. I mean, they sold everything they had, or if they didn't sell it, they brought it with them. Sometimes they would take big, heavy furniture, um, maybe a family heirloom furniture that was passed down for many generations. They would take it on their covered wagons um, as they prepared and set off on their journey. They were excited. You know, they didn't really understand what they were going to have to go through. And it's kind of like us at baptism. We become convicted and we set off on this journey excited, not really truly understanding what we may have to go through on this journey. Two months in, and realizing, they realized how difficult their journey was going to be. You know, think about the Israelites at the Red Sea cross, after the Red Sea crossing, two months in. They had to ford rivers. Families sometimes would get swept away by a river. They had to band together in, in the 50s, 100s sometimes, um, because, you know, they could attack. And they usually wouldn't attack if it was a big group. There's so much they didn't know. Um, sometimes a disease would sweep through the wagon trains and an entire family could have been wiped out. But they, they had to band together. But that also meant there's, you know, there's no turning back because if you turn back, you would have been alone and you would have been, you know, it, you, you would have risked Native Americans attack. Brethren, just like us, we have to walk in this Christian life together. We can't walk it alone. It's too dangerous, and we can't look back at what we left behind. As they march forward, they realize that some of the things that they thought they needed, some of the things that they thought, thought they were going to use, they had to discard. That family heirloom that for generations was passed down, they, they had to leave it on the trail. It was too heavy, maybe an anvil, a treasured, piece, a treasured piece of furniture. They had to leave it along the trail. And there would be stories of literal, a literal trail of abandoned, abandoned things, baggage left on the Oregon Trail for people to later on to pick. Brother, how much of our former life do we take with us on our journey? How much of our baggage do we keep with us? Our sins that we carry with us, our guilt, our hang-ups, bitterness, or hatred, our issues and problems. How much of our former lives do we take with us? Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest in your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Brother, how often do we carry the baggage instead of casting our burdens on the Lord. These folks on the Oregon Trail realized that they couldn't have been living, they can't live in both Virginia and in Oregon. They had to choose one. 
Just like the Israelites leaving Egypt, they, they can't live in Egypt and pine for Egypt and live and travel to the, the promised land. Like us, we can't live in this world and simultaneously live in the kingdom. If it wasn't the treachery of the Rocky Mountains, if it wasn't animal attacks, Indian attacks, diseases, rivers they had to ford, those hunger, thirst, those things they all have to worry about. Sometimes the greatest threat, the greatest threat to these folks was themselves. Sometimes there would be disagreements in the wagon trains, there would be fights among families traveling, and sometimes they would end up shooting each other, turning against each other. Sometimes for us, brethren, the greatest threat isn't the keeping of the law, it isn't what's happening in the outside world, it isn't the election, COVID. And it, sometimes all these things isn't what's dangerous and what gets us, but brothers offending brothers, Christians offending and getting offended by each other. We see that so often on splits, people leaving because of an offense, but we can't we have to stick together on this journey because it's difficult to survive there alone. A lot of them made it, a lot of them made it to Oregon. And when they made it to Oregon, they weren't the same, they weren't the same New Yorkers, they weren't the same Virginians that they left behind, that they were before they made this journey. The journey had made them tougher. The journey had made them more adaptable, smarter, and they have learned skills that they weren't expecting to learn. They had learned endurance. They had learned to work together to keep moving forward. And we hear these stories and they became real pioneers, real trailblazers. Let's, let's go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 and verse eight. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the, of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham didn't know how the journey would go. He didn't expect it would take so long for the... the, the for his son Isaac to be born. I'm sure he wasn't expecting how things, how long it would take. He probably didn't know that he would. He didn't expect the twists and turns of the, the journey that he had set. Jumping down to verse 32. Um, what more shall I say? Uh, Hebrews 11, verse 32. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, also of David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, work righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of aliens. And these are such amazing things that they were able to do. Women, re women receive their dead raised to life again. Can you imagine stopping the mouth of lions like Daniel, quenching the violence of fire? How encouraging. Dropping down, others were tortured, not accepting, accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. What? Still others had trials of mockings and scourgings, yes, of chains and imprisonment. You know, I don't know if that's what I signed up for. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, and of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in the deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. When, we, when that die is cast, brethren, we don't know if our lives are going to be like what we see here in verse 33 to 35, or if it's going to be 36, uh, verses 36 to 38. But we, what we do know, if we keep reading on and encouraging, 
news is that, and all these having obtained a good testimony through faith did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. The journey is not over yet. The journey is not complete yet. They're still waiting on us here. They're still living. Chapter 12, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, every weight, brethren, just like all the weight, the sins, the heavy burdens that we carry with us in our lives, just like on the Oregon Trail, setting aside every weight, moving forward, and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance, run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. He started us on his journey when he called us, when he said to us, Follow me, when he called out to you and said, Follow me. And Christ will finish the journey with us, and he will complete the journey and complete our faith. And he promises victory. No matter what happens in between, in between. From the spectrum of what we see here in, in, in Hebrews 11.32, of all these amazing things happening and all the things that the, the, the Christians had to go through, torture, wandering, quenching the violence of fire, stopping the mouths of lions, whatever it is, Christ promises that we will have victory. We don't know what, happened, what will happen in our, in our lives when we set off on this journey. When we, we don't expect the trials that we will face, getting sick, what's happening in the world today, people we may have to bury, the things that we need to give up, the hard choices, the successes, the failures, the lessons learned. We leave it to God because God knows how the dice will fall. Proverbs 16.33 says, the lot is cast, but every decision is from God. Brethren, as people of faith, there's no turning back. We've crossed the Rubicon, and the only thing left to do is to see it through. The trail may be uncertain, it may be difficult, it may be rocky, but God knows the outcome, and he knows how the die will land. The victory is guaranteed, brethren. We give up everything to gain everything. Aaliyah. I act a est, the die is cast.